I'm Hannah Fuchs from MTA's Office of Biotechnology Products. And as you can see, I'm attending virtually this year, but looking forward to seeing you all in person at next year's meeting. Um, we have an exciting day two planned uh, with two interesting sessions, each followed by a panel discussion. But before that, we are starting this morning with our keynote presentation. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for this meeting, Dr. Marjorie Shapiro. Margie has a long history with monoclonal antibodies. She received her PhD in immunology from the University of Pennsylvania, where she studied molecular mechanisms underlying antibody diversity, and then joined, ultimately joined the Division of Monoclonal Antibodies at FDA back in 1993. Uh, Margie is currently a lab chief in the Division of Biotechnology Review and Research One in the Office of Biotechnology Products, where her lab continues to do research on monoclonal antibodies. Margie is also an amazing resource for folks in the OBP regarding anything monoclonal antibodies, as well as related products such as ADCs, bispecifics, antibody cocktails, FC fusion proteins, and on and on. And she's basically been involved with, as far as I know, every guidance and policy that impact monoclonal antibodies at FDA for many years, including being instrumental in the development of our thinking related to biosimilars. Um, on a side note, I have benefited from Margie's willingness to share her wealth of information with others. I was lucky enough to be her office mate at the start of my career at FDA, where I learned to appreciate Margie's ability to synthesize the issues at hand, as well as her wide view of things in a way that puts everything in their appropriate place. And also in a way that reminds me today of the information we're getting from the new James Webb telescope, very clear, sharp, well-defined. And like the James Webb telescope, Margie has a good insight into the origins and history, in this case of monoclonal antibodies, their regulation, as well as the history, concepts, and development of FDA's thinking that has brought us to this to present. So please all welcome Margie Shapiro to the virtual podium. When, when Hannah first asked me on behalf of the organizing committee uh, to, to speak at the meeting, I asked her, I said, well, what does the organizing committee want? What can I tell them that they don't already know or that they haven't already heard a lot from the FDA? And she said, no, no, Margie, you don't understand. This is the keynote talk. You have a lot of leeway, go big. It's a multimodal world and get out of your wheelhouse about monoclonal antibodies, uh, which she told you that that is uh, really what my expertise is. So I'm gonna try to do that today and um, I hope uh, it'll be fun. So um, here is uh, the OPQ uh, message that, uh, that we're all about product quality. And in the end, you know, we need to make sure that our patients have confidence in every dose of medicine they take and product quality is a big part of that. Here is the usual FDA disclaimer. So these are some of the things I'm going to talk about. The universe of bioassays, uh, drug development and candidate selection, some lessons learned uh, that lead to next generation products, challenges uh, for designing bioassays and potency assays for antibody drug conjugates and bispecific antibodies, common assays across product classes, new bioassays for old products, do we always need a bioassay for quality control purposes? And then some take home messages. So uh, when I was beginning to, to think about this talk, I was thinking about the universe of bioassays. And um, you know, it starts very early in research uh, for basic research, both in vitro and in vivo types of bioassays to help understand uh, biological pathways and, and diseases. And then we continue to need bioassays uh, during the candidate selection stage, again, both in vitro and in vivo, and both characterization and preclinical studies, although it's not on this slide, in vitro and in vivo methods as well. And then for quality control purposes, mostly in vitro, but some older products uh, continue to have in vivo assays as well. Um, but there have been uh, challenges and a lot of drug failures. And the Accelerating Medicines Partnership is a, a public-private partnership that was formed to try to improve um, understanding of therapeutically relevant biological pathways to try to get drugs approved for some of these difficult indications. 
It came about because although there have been a lot of great advances that have provided data on the biological causes of diseases, uh, it's been challenging moving these discoveries into getting treatments. And this is in part due to the result of poor target selection and preclinical experiments in cell-based or animal models that don't properly reflect uh, human disease. So again, when, when I started thinking about this talk in February before the meeting got moved, this very fascinating uh, article was published. It's a tour de force. It's a multidisciplinary big science approach. Um, in this case, they used uh, pre-existing small molecule drugs, but they put them in uh, over 2000 pairwise combinations and the drugs were targeting different pathways. And they tested them against 125 different cell lines from breast, colorectal and pancreatic cancer. And you know, using bioassays and the outputs of the combinations and multi-omics approach, they found uh, combinations with uh, synergistic effects in specific cell lines. Um, and so overall, synergy was rare, but they came up with 192 possible combinations. So I think you know, today, you know, big science um, can help play a role in, in trying to come up with good products, but there's always a role for bioassays um, in, these, in these studies. So uh, now, so clearly um, bioassays are also important in early drug development activities. You know, it starts with review of literature and in-house research. Do you understand if there's a causal role in disease and is the target druggable? It certainly helps to know if it's druggable, if you have the 3D confirmation. You know, what are the available animal models? Do you need to generate a surrogate antibody or a surrogate product for other types of, of uh, therapeutic proteins? You know, can you develop an organ on a chip or, or use 3D spheroids to study it? You know, are there potential biomarkers? And it clearly helps to develop the target product profile early on. Um, and as you all know better than I do, there's a lot of overlap among these early R&D activities and it requires multidisciplinary teams. But it's very crucial not only to, you know, to def define the target product profile as early as possible. So then bioassays also play a role in, in these early R&D activities to help define the target product profile, the, quali the quality target product profile, and also to make, no, to make go or no-go decisions to initiate clinical studies. So for lead discovery, you need a target assessment that includes evidence supporting the rationale for the selecting the target and experimental validation of the target. And screening preparation um, is crucial and can take a, a long time because you need to develop the appropriate reagents for the assays you're going to use for screening. You might need expression constructs. You might need to purify some proteins. And this could uh, take some time. And then uh, you uh, have some, some lead candidates, but you want to optimize them and characterize them. Maybe you engineer them for specific purposes. So then you need to go back and test them again in some bioassays to make sure your engineering accomplished its goal. You know, there might be pharmacokinetic and immunogenicity de-risking strategies. <clears throat> and then, you know, do you have the right assays to assess all these features of your candidates? So you clearly want to try to avoid some pitfalls. So it's crucial to think about all these characteristics before you get into the expensive clinical studies. So as you're designing your product, you, know, you need to think about the product profile, its stability, PK and, bio, and bioavailability, as well as immunogenicity. Um, and potency testing is, is the most commonly used selection test but it needs to rely on the develop of a well-characterized assay based on the mechanism of action. So binding assays are important, especially if affinity matters, but for most products, they're not sufficient. So you need to understand what happens after uh, your molecule binds. So the effort up front at the selection stage can, stage can really pay dividends later in development. Uh, and they can help you identify assays for your product characterization, release, and stability. So uh, again, gains in understanding a disease uh, helps improve a target-based approach to lead discovery and candidate selection, but uh, sometimes targets engineered into simplified cell-based assays aren't always um, reflective 
of, of what's going to occur uh, when you have a complex environment of intact organisms. And even the results from gene engineering and model species may not translate to patients. So all along the way, no matter how hard you try, there might always be some uh, barriers to success of a product, but it certainly helps to have as much knowledge as possible up front. So here's an example where a screening assay was based on binding to a trimeric ligand, but the assay conditions that were used caused dissociation of the trimer into its monomeric uh, components. And so you got, um, you lost epitope expression. And so the, the assay wasn't uh, suitable for its purpose. And so a lot of potential candidates were not, were not um, chosen. So the lessons learned would be that if you have a better, understand, a better understanding of the underlying mechanisms of disease, it can help you identify appropriate targets. But if, if the bioassays used to identify and select lead candidates are inadequate, it can result in failure later in clinical development. So now we're gonna talk about some lessons learned uh, that can lead to next generation products. So here you start out with understanding the biology of disease and perhaps its molecular pathways. You design your therapeutic, you do uh, some manufacturing development, characterization, preclinical studies. You go through clinical trials and continuing characterization of your product. And maybe it doesn't take you to a submission. It's a clinical trial failure. You figure out what went wrong. Maybe you learn more about the disease and the pathways. You either redesign a therapeutic or maybe you design a better clinical study. But uh, if things go well, you might get approval, but the product could have a narrow therapeutic index and a small indication because the benefit risks uh, might be worth it for that population, but not for others. Or maybe you have a very successful product, but we continue learning about uh, the biological pathways and the disease. So there are better designs for a next generation product. So in that case, you know, we have continued understanding of the biology of the disease. Maybe you get second generation products, you uh, bio betters or novel constructs, constructs, and the cycle just continues. But every, but every failure, um, some good can come from it if we learn lessons. So here's an example of, of rational design products. So uh, Aldous Lucan and IL-2 was approved in 1992 for metastatic renal cell cancer and in 1998 for metastatic melanoma. It uses a high dose. It has a black box warning for capillary leak syndrome and a lot of really serious um, adverse events, including you know, possible coma. The therapeutic value is limited by frequent dosing for five consecutive days, but it has a short half-life, severe toxicities, and lack of efficacy in most patients, and lowering the dose to mitigate the toxicity results in reduced responses. But since that time, there's a much better understanding of IL-2 activity and signaling pathways. Uh, we know that it has both immunostimulatory and immunosuppressive activity. So the immunostimulatory activity might be useful in oncology indications, whereas the immunosuppressive activity could be useful in um, autoimmune indications. So there are opposite targets. You want to stimulate effector T cells in oncology and induce regulatory T cells to, for autoimmune indications. And you don't necessarily want to target either uh, regulatory T cells or T effector cells respectively in, in the other types of indications. So there's been a lot of re-engineering of IL-2 for a longer half-life, for specific IL-2 receptor targeting, for specific T cell subsets, and localization to specific tissues to optimize efficacy and reduce toxicity. And um, I would say just earlier in the week at the CMC Strategy Forum, there was a really interesting talk by, I think it was Chris Memes of a, a company called Synthorx, which is a Sanofi company where they're engineering um, non-natural amino acids into their products, and they can use that as a conjugation site. But he described an, an, a pegylated IL-2 uh, that was designed not only for extended half-life, but um, for reduced uh, alpha, uh, IL-2 alpha chain receptor interaction. So um, 
Here is what the IL-2 receptor looks like. It comes either as a three-chain receptor or a two-chain receptor, and it's expressed on different types of effector cells. And in the case of the three-chain receptor, it's either constitutively expressed or transiently expressed. So sponsors have developed different strategies depending on, on uh, the cell type and the receptor that they want the IL-2 to interact with. And so the idea is to exploit the different IL-2 receptor configurations to design these IL-2 molecules for different indications. And you need appropriate bioassays for its intended activity. Um, now I would say the, the, the article that these figures came from is, is from a different company than, 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 uh, than the one that Chris works for. Um, but there was a, a recent news about a pegylated IL-2 agonist. The jury is still out because there was some disappointing news uh, of this product in combination with nivolumab in that it didn't show a clinical benefit but there are other molecules out there and other designs. So uh, we'll have to wait and see if, if some other uh, programs might show success. And then there are these other molecules, these IL-2 mutines, where they're mutated to attenuate binding to IL-2 at different interfaces that are being developed for autoimmune diseases. Um, they're early in clinical development. So again, we'll have to wait and see how these rationally designed IL-2 molecules uh, turn out. Now, some of you may remember the tragic failure of TGN-1412, uh, which was an IgG4 anti-CD28 super agonist antibody, which was intended to activate regular, regulatory T cells without co-stimulation through the T cell receptor by an antigen presenting cell. And it, it was a super agonist because it bound a different epitope than more conventional anti-CD28 antibody, so it could bypass signaling through the T cell receptor. It was intended to treat autoimmune diseases and B cell leukemia, but the first in human healthy volunteer study um, uh, uh, was um, horrible. The, even though the dose was 500 times lower than was used in animal studies, um, and they used 10 minute dosing intervals uh, between dosing six volunteers. All six of the healthy volunteers experienced severe cytokine release syndrome. Uh, several of them had multiple organ failure and one volunteer lost uh, toes and most of their fingers. So what went wrong? Uh, the preclinical studies in Sanomolgus and rhesus monkeys didn't show anything of concern. There's 100% homology between the human and cytomolgus and rhesus CD28 extracellular domain. Repeat those preclinical studies showed expansion of T cells with no signs of toxicity across doses, uh, only moderate increases in cytokines, but no clinical manifestations of clinical of cytokine release syndrome, and no signals from in vitro studies on human PBMCs. But what was later discovered is that CD28 is expressed on tissue resident uh, CD4 effector memory T cells in humans, but it's down reg regulated on these cells in cytomolgus monkeys. So, and it is these uh, effectory memory T cells that secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. There was also some research that indicated a possible role for FC gamma R2B, even uh, so that uh, the IgG4 TGN1412 would uh, bind uh, FC gamma R2B and, and form immune complexes and transduce some signal. And that occurred even though it's an IgG4. And clearly uh, there wasn't a, a complete understanding of all the target cells recognized by the antibody. So we learned many lessons uh, from, from that experience. Um, it led to changes in many aspects of clinical trial design with impact across all products um, that could uh, uh, engage uh, uh, immune effector cells. So there's definitely a different approach to determining a safe starting dose. There's a lengthened dosing interval between patients and more diligent monitoring of patients. And there are now different designs for in vitro cell-based studies to detect cytokine release. Um, surprisingly, the molecule is back in the clinic with a new name. It uses a much lot lower dose, a thousand fold lower than the initial clinical trial, but it can still activate uh, T-regs without the release of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. 
and a healthy volunteer study has been completed and there are clinical trials ongoing in autoimmune diseases and some solid tumors. So there are other challenges when choosing candidate molecules. Uh, so when we think about TNF and TNF receptor family trimers, you know, again, do you need to engage all three molecules in the trimer or is one sufficient? Um, are you binding a soluble or a membrane bound target? If both does binding soluble antigen interfere with the proposed mechanism of action? Uh, since we're talking about trimers and, and, and since COVID has been su such a, a prominent um, area uh, for our industry and the FDA in the last two years, you know, spike protein comes in trimers. It has two configurations up and down. Um, you know, if you're trying to target it, you know, are you inducing conformational changes? Um, do you want to target the receptor binding domain and terminal domain? and or the S2 domain of, of the spike protein? Do you want your antibody to have effector function or not? Um, if you're targeting a soluble ligand, does it have multiple receptors? Is receptor expression limited on different cell types? Are you targeting a specific receptor on a specific cell type? Are you targeting a homodimer versus a heterodimer? And if so, how do you best target these dimers? And for antibodies, epitope matters. Distance from the membrane can affect antibody effector function activity. And depending on, on your epitope, you could end up with an antibody that has agonist or antagonist activity. So what is it you want for your indication? So here's an example of targeting HER3. Um, early uh, antibodies that targeted HER3 were largely unsuccessful. Uh, due to pleiotropic effects on downstream pathways and different dimerization partners and a lack of predictive biomarkers. But there are now next generation uh, monoclonal antibodies. Um, so, so some of them bind a specific epitope at the dimerization interface. And also this NRG1 fusion positive cancer seems to be a, a biomarker for, um, for uh, targeting HER3. We also have antibody drug conjugates that use HER3 as a tumor antigen, so it doesn't need to block a signaling event. And there are also bispecifics that are targeting a HER3 and generally another member of the family, so it adds an inhibition of a second pathway. So even though the first generation anti-HER3 antibodies were largely unsuccessful, uh, just understanding better the, the molecule and other pathways about it second generation products are now in development and hopefully will be successful. So again, I mentioned epitope matters, a <clears throat> distance from the membrane. So in this study, they, they um, looked at a rituximab and alentuzumab. This is the figure for rituximab, where they look at CD20, uh, the normal CD20 configuration on the cell surface, but they took the epitope and they placed it on, on uh, a larger protein so it was further distance from the membrane. And the closer the epitope was to the membrane, the better antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity and complement activity you had. And the further it was from the membrane, the better uh, phagocytosis activity you had. And the same results were seen with different monoclonal antibodies targeting mesothelin. The antibody that was closer to the membrane had better ADCC activity while the antibody that was further away from the membrane had better phagocytosis activity. Again, epitope matters. This is showing uh, the CD20 epitopes recognized by several uh, marketed anti-CD20 antibodies, but where they bind and the angle at which they bind determines the type of activity they have. So for example, the, the type two antibodies, uh, Gaziva is, is an example of that. They have lower comp, uh, complement activity relative to the type one activities. And Ofatumumab, which is a type one along with Rituximab, apparently has better complement activity than Rituximab. So that may be due to the epitope. Um, and then also the type twos can induce uh, stronger cell death than the type one antibodies. So now we're going to planet potency. Um, so I, 
even though I'm trying to go beyond my wheelhouse of antibodies, I always like to talk about antibody approvals uh, because they've, they've increased so much over my time at the agency. But there's uh, the more recent ones, we see a lot of rational design. So there are seven that, are, that have been glyco-engineered. There are numerous that have been FC engineered and that includes the, the serine to proline mutation for IgG4s. We have 11 antibody drug conjugates with three different DNA damaging agents, two different microtubule inhibitors, and one bacterial toxin. We've approved bi five bispecifics, one T-cell engager that's a fragment with no FC, three full-length antibody structures that use different uh, ways to, for, for pairing, and one that's a TCR construct. So it's an uh, it's, it's anti-CD19, uh, I'm sorry, an anti-CD3, arm, and then the other arm is actually a, a, a T cell receptor rather than an antibody. And we've approved two cocktails. And even though they're not on this graph, we've also approved 11 types of FC fusion proteins, seven that are receptors, two are peptides, two are uh, coagulation factors. These two are approved by CBER. And we've approved just a soluble FC region. So you can see that um, you know there's a lot of uh, products with specific designs. And the potency assays and characterization methods should reflect the intentional design of the molecules. So I'm going to spend some time talking about antibody drug conjugates and bispecifics. So for antibody drug conjugate mechanisms of action, clearly you need to bind the target. In most cases, they're expected to internalize and release the payload, payload and then disrupt the internal target, target, which is either tubulin or DNA. But sometimes, um, in addition to internalization, some of the linkers are designed to release some payload prior to internalization to improve bystander effects. So some challenges for bioassays and potency assays are that you need to characterize the mechanisms of action as appropriate for the specific payload and the monoclonal antibody. So clearly you want to show that the antibody binds the target and that the conjugation process doesn't disrupt that. For cytotoxicity of drug substance and drug product, you know, you, you want to demonstrate that because that indicates binding internalization re release of payload as well as cell killing. So it's useful to have a negative control, which is a cell line that doesn't express the target to demonstrate specificity. And then you should also assess antibody effector functions uh, to know if, if they might play any role. However, uh, in the case where the payload is intentionally released prior to internalization for bystander effects, this complicates the cytotoxicity assay uh, because you don't know how much of the cytotoxicity is, is due to bystander effects or how much is due to internalization. Whether or not that matters for release uh, might be uh, something to discuss with the review team but uh, it just complicates understanding uh, exactly what is going on with your product. So um, it may be possible to use a cell line that doesn't express the target to assess bystander effects, at least for characterization. Um, you should justify the assays that should be used for release and stability. Um, all assays used across the antibody intermediate drug substance and drug product may not be needed for each of these components by the time of a BLA. You may not need binding assay for drug substance and drug product once it's shown that conjugation doesn't affect binding, but sometimes the binding assay may be a better stability indicating method than the cytotoxicity assay. So it just depends on your particular product and, and all the assays that you've used to understand its mechanisms. And also for ADCs, the drug to antibody ratio is useful as a control for potency and can also help ensure consistent dosing and safety, um, especially when early in development, the cytotoxicity assay might have a um, somewhat broad uh, release criteria. Uh, but then we're seeing a lot of antibody drug conjugates with novel payloads. So for example, there are several that, you, that have uh, uh, toll-like receptor agonists. So here, the activation of the toll-like receptor agonist, um, you want to study the activation of, of the agonist on the target effector cells. 
you want to understand uh, the release of cytokines by these target cells. Uh, you need to uh, you know, uh, clearly show antigen binding on the target disease cells and still also understand if your product has antibody effector functions. There are some oli oligonucleotide um, conjugates that are designed to downregulate the target messenger RNA. Uh, so again, you need to demonstrate that the antigen binding, that the antigen binds the target cells and that everything can get internalized and the oligonucleotide can downregulate the target messenger RNA. And again, you know, you, you should want lack of effector function here. So you should uh, design your product for that. And then there are other types of uh, uh, conjugates that, that provide some type of antagonist activity. So again, your assay should be appropriate for the specific action of the antagonist payload, uh, should be related to the intended action of the payload, such as cell death or inhibition of a pathway. You want to show that it binds target cells. Uh, Bispecifics, as you all know, come in many, many formats. They could have uh, uh, either uh, be monovalent for each target or bivalent for each target or monovalent for one tar target and bivalent for the other. They have symmetric and asymmetric designs. They may or may not have an FC region. There are bispecific fusion proteins and conjugates as well. So these are very complex molecules. And they have many mechanisms of action depending on their design. So they could, they could be either activating or inhibiting a signal, you know, binding two antigens on a cell or binding two soluble ligands and preventing binding to receptor most of them are designed to recruit effector cells. Um, emicizumab is, is mimicking cofactors, so it replaces factor eight in hemophilia. And some are designed to, to, to be a homing agent or a shuttle where you're delivering, for example, a drug across the blood-brain barrier. So depending on your mechanism will determine what types of uh, bioassays you may need for characterization and, and for potency. So again, you would need to characterize the mechanisms of action as appropriate for the, anti for the bispecific antibody and the indication. You may need multiple bioassays and a justification for what should be used for release and stability. Uh, uh, if you have a combinatorial mechanism of action where each arm binding to the antigen is independent of the other, you may not need an assay showing that the, the bispecific can bind both antigens at the same time. Uh, if it's an obligate mechanism of action where both arms need to bind, it may be sequential, such as in a shuttle construct. But if it's a physical linkage, you should have an assay showing that both antigens bind at the same time. Um, if you have a fixed ratio of specificities, do you need something different depending on the valencies you have? Um, what downstream effects of binding need to be captured? Um, is one assay sufficient? and do both antigens need to be bound by the same bispecific? So now we're getting into a multimodal world. Um, biologics, there are different categories, not just antibodies, but we have vaccines and, and uh, hyperimmune globulins and gene and cell therapies and other types of therapeutic proteins. And uh, across all those product classes, generally uh, at the FDA, our expectations for development of assays are the same but how we approach them might be more specific to the product class. But as I was thinking about, about my talk, you know, I was thinking about, again, because COVID has been so prominent in the last two years, I think a lot of products that target viral diseases do use similar types of assays. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show some comparisons between antibodies and different product classes. So we'll start with hyperimmune globulins because they're the most similar. So for monoclonal antibodies, we want neutralization assays and uh, effector function activity assays if, if the antibody is designed to have that. And generally, um, we, we want to see uh, uh, that it can neutralize live virus or pseudotype virus or viral-like particles. Um, we want to see both in vitro and in vivo. And the in vivo you know, is for our uh, virology colleagues. It's not for the CMC portion, but we need to understand that, that the products can, can neutralize the authentic virus. Um, and then you would need to assess the ability to neutralize different variants or strains or subtypes depending on the virus. 
And that's similar for the hyperimmune globulins, a neutralization assay with live virus, pseudovirus, um, in vitro and in vivo studies, and the ability to neutralize the, uh, uh, the range of variants or new variants. Um, for CMC purposes, for potency assays, again, depending on the virus, a live virus or pseudotype virus or viral like particle neutralization assay is acceptable based on the biosafety level categorization. If it's a uh, monoclonal antibody or cocktail intended to neutralize different strains or subtypes, such as cocktails from HIV or flu, um, you would need to justify the specific strains or subtypes used in the potency assay. For what's going on with SARS-CoV-2, you don't need to add new variants to the potency assay, um, even if the, the currently circulating strain is different, but you would need to demonstrate for the purposes of our virology colleagues that the antibody is still uh, able to neutralize the circulating variants. Um, and then for all these products, you may need to control, of, control effector functions. For hyperimmune globulins, for uh, the potency assay, again, live virus or pseudovirus neutralization assays are acceptable uh, depending on the BSL categorization. Uh, for them, use of pseudovirus should be correlated with infectious virus assay. There may be exceptions where the neutralizing assay is challenging to validate, and apparently this is true for hepatitis B. In some cases, ELISA can be used for characterization of clinical lots, but this is rare. Effector functions are usually for characterization, but not always. And for IVIGs, uh, potency testing requires neutralizing titers for some viruses. Um, and CBER standards are used to control, are used for controls for these release tests when compared to reference material. Uh, for, for vaccines, um, for preclinical, they ask for an assessment of the immunogenicity elicited by the vaccine. So they look for B cells or T cell responses. Uh, they want qualified preclinical uh, and fully validated post-vaccination and clinical studies. Um, they want an assessment of functional immune response using in vitro neutralization assays with live virus or pseudotype virus and uh, assess the ability to neutralize different isolates um, and then when there are new variants um, to update or revalidate. And for CMC, the potency assay, they want a live virus or pseudotype virus neutralization assay, again, based on the BSL categorization. They want it validated prior to phase three or testing phase three samples. Assay should be specific for the virus strain or variant against which the immune response is measured. If the vaccine is modified for a particular variant, the assay should be updated should have a link to the immunogenicity or protection and the assay, recent stability assay should be strain specific. So even viral vectors for gene therapies have something in common with the other product types and that is the idea of infectivity assay. So for antibodies and hyperimmune globulins and vaccines, they use neutralization assays, but they're essentially infectivity assays and you're looking for the, the ability of the, the product or the antibodies elicited by the vaccine to neutralize infectivity. But for gene therapies that use a viral vector, they do have an infectivity assay uh, to determine virus titers. And I think we heard a little bit about that yesterday. Um, uh, infectivity assay is a uh, variability can be an issue. But there are similar approaches to selecting appropriate cell lines, establish growth conditions, and validate the assays, and they are product specific. So um, for monoclonal antibodies, clearly we have a good understanding of the critical quality attributes. Um, our major mechanism of action should be understood, you know, neutralization and or effective functions, and we may need additional assays to control effective function. For gene therapies, clearly there are a lot of unique challenges for potency assays. The critical quality attributes are not entirely understood. Um, there may be some gene therapies though that are, encoding, that are encoding antibodies. And so certainly you can use the knowledge of antibody critical quality attributes to, to make sure that the, that the expressed antibody you know, uh, has some of those uh, critical quality attributes as well. But overall, for gene therapies, the mechanisms of actions and assays are very complex. Again, the mechanisms may not be fully understood. Um, 
They need to recognize the target. You need to sustain, sustain cell growth, intracellular signaling, and killing the target. There's maybe limited time for testing if fresh cells are used. You may need additional appropriate assays, such as transgene expression, vector titer, assays for transfected cells, cytokine production, so forth and so on. And potency assays may not correlate with in vivo efficacy due to cell expansion and persistence over time. Uh, for CAR T cell products, cytokine release is a commonly accepted potency assay uh, where you get cytokine production upon stimulation by the target. So now the question is, you know, do we need to develop new bioassays for old products? And I come back to the TNF antagonists, of which there are five approved molecules, and they have different types of structures. Three are full-length antibodies. One's an FC fusion protein, and one is a FAB, a pegylated FAB. And you can see that they, their specificities for, uh, for TNF are, are different. Some recognize only the trimer, and some can recognize both the trimer and the monomer. And they're approved for different indications. And in some cases, it seems like the inflammatory bowel diseases sort of stand out. Um, for, for some of these, I think, you know, for galimumab, I'm, I'm not sure it's been studied in, in all these diseases, but there's no reason to think that it would be different from adalimumab or infliximab. But sertilizumab and etanercept uh, do seem to be a little bit different. So at the time that they were first approved, you know, we thought that uh, basically blocking, bind, blocking TNF binding to its receptor was, was the major mechanism of action. And that's true for all the general indications, but for the inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, it's thought that maybe there is more, more activity through binding membrane bound TNF. So the, there are these other activities that seem likely and even some FC effector functions might be pl plausible in these indications. So for second generation products or biosimilars, we definitely would have more expectations for a variety of bioassays to understand the products than, than we did when these products were first approved. So now is a bioassay always needed? Um, so for transition products, uh, which were products originally approved as NDAs. They were deemed as BLAs in March, 2020. Um, but now we have products that would have been in that category that are now being developed as, as BLAs. And as we heard earlier um, in this conference, you know, uh, there's a difference between strength rather than potency. Um, and I think you all understand those differences. So there is a Q and A guidance document about transition products where the question is, you know, are there different requirements? And the answer is yes, there are some differences, but expect many of them to be minimal due to similar types of considerations between product types. Um, there may be some requirements to report or provide different information than is required for biological products. And we may recommend changes to the control strategy throughout the product life cycle to modernize control strategies um, and to address product specific issues and to help ensure that biological products remain safe, pure and potent. But whether or not um, there'll, there'll be changes in potency assays will be discussion between the review team and, and the sponsor, but I don't really expect a lot of changes there. However, but for traditional therapeutic proteins, um, we don't always use bioassays for release. So enzymes, we had some enzymes that were regulated as BLAs. Um, they use enzymatic assays. For enzyme replacement therapies, there might be bioassays as part, of, as part of characterizations to demonstrate the enzyme can enter the cell, but generally not for release. Thrombolytics use clot lysis assays. Um, new peptides and proteins that are now regulated as BLAs, uh, I imagine we have expectations that you should include methods other than assay to assess potency. Depending on the proposed mechanism, though, it could be a cell-based assay or a cell-free assay. But even some monoclonal antibodies may not need bioassays for release. For example, antibodies that target bacterial toxins may not need it. Or if you're targeting an, an, uh, an extracellular target that, and you're blocking an extracellular event, you may not need a bioassay for that. There is an expectation, though, that FC effector functions be characterized but even in some cases where a bioassay would be appropriate and generally preferred, 
a cell-free assay may be acceptable if it's shown to be better or superior to the cell-based assay, but the uh, cell-free assay should reflect the proposed mechanism such as inhibition of an activity. And uh, maybe the cell-based assay could be continued as support for comparability. But regardless of the product class, uh, if, if you want to develop an assay that is not a bioassay where the agency has been requesting one, you should provide data to support your position and always discuss it with the review team. So my take home messages are that we're never done learning about how our products work and the diseases they're used to treat. And this comes from uh, not just literature and, and understanding, but it's an accumulation of knowledge gained by both industry and health authorities working together. Um, continuous learning leads to new and improved bioassays, better products and hopefully better clinical outcomes. Bioassays are important throughout a life cycle. Close attention to developing bioassays during candidate selection and optimization lays the groundwork for those assays for preclinical assessment, CMC characterization, release and stability methods. Potency assays and characterization methods should reflect the major mechanisms of action and intentional design of the molecule. Uh, it's always good to update methods for older products. And a bioassays for quality control purposes may not be needed for some products, uh, but provide the justification and always discuss it with the review team. So with that, I'd like to thank Hannah for uh, having discussions with me about my talk and also my quintet of CBER colleagues. If I um, stated anything incorrectly, it is on me and not on them. And if you have questions about that, uh, you should discuss it with the CBER review teams. And finally, for people who are interested, here are the, the links to all the um, references that I cited. Thank you very much.